In an extraordinary mystical experience given to St. Bridget, Christ tells her not to be afraid. The Lord explains that the devil is symbolized by a snake and a lion. He then reveals how to resist the cunning serpent. In another revelation, the Blessed Virgin Mary speaks on how Satan cunningly leads souls astray beneath the veil of devotion. Virgo Putens presents Prophecies and Revelations of St. Bridget of Sweden, Book 4, Chapters 14 through 16. Chapter 14 The Son of God says, why are you afraid and anxious that the devil may insert things into the words of the Holy Spirit? Have you ever heard of anyone who kept his tongue safe and sound by placing it in between the teeth of an angry lion? Has anyone ever sucked sweet honey from the tail of a snake? No, never. Now what does the lion or snake symbolize if not the devil? a lion in evil, and a snake in cunning. What does the tongue symbolize if not the consolation of the Holy Spirit? What does it mean to place one's tongue between the teeth of a lion if not to utter the words of the Holy Spirit, who appeared in the shape of a tongue, in order to gain human favor and praise? Anyone who speaks God's praises for human gratification has surely been bitten and deceived by the devil, because those words, though they come from God, are not coming from a mouth that has the love of God, and so that person's tongue, that is, the consolation of the Holy Spirit, will be taken away from him or her. However, a person who desires nothing but God, and finds all worldly affairs bothersome, whose body does not seek to see or hear anything but what comes from God, whose soul rejoices in the infusion of the Holy Spirit. Such a person cannot be deceived, for the evil spirit yields to the good spirit and does not dare to approach it. What does sucking honey from a snake's tail mean if not waiting for the consolation of the Holy Spirit to come from the suggestions of the devil? That consolation will never come, because the devil would rather let himself be slain a thousand times over than offer a word of consolation to a soul, the utterance of which might lead the soul to the meaning of life. Fear not, for God who began a good work with you, will carry it through to a good end. But know that the devil is like an unleashed dog that comes running to you with his temptations and suggestions when he sees you lacking the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. However, if you should place a hard object in his way to hurt or paralyze his teeth, he will immediately leap away from you and will not harm you. The hard object placed in the devil's way signifies divine charity and obedience to God's commands. When the devil sees that these virtues are perfect in you, his teeth, that is, his attempts and his intention, will immediately be frustrated, because he sees that you would suffer anything rather than go against God's commands. The words of Christ to St. Bridget about why the good suffer in this life while the bad prosper, and how God shows her through a parable that he sometimes promises temporal goods, but that these should be taken to mean spiritual goods, and about why God has not predicted every single event to happen at a particular time, although all times and seasons are known to him. Chapter 15 the Son of God says, You are wondering why you have heard that a certain friend of God, who should be honored, is suffering hardships, while, on the other hand, you have heard that a certain enemy of God, who you thought should be whipped, has been honored, as was told you in another divine vision. I answer, 
my words should be taken in both a spiritual and a bodily sense. What is the suffering of the world, if not a kind of preparation and elevation to the crown of reward? And what does worldly prosperity mean for someone who abuses grace, if not a kind of descent into perdition? To suffer in the world is truly an ascension to life. But for the unrighteous, prospering in the world is truly a descent into hell. In order to build up your patience by means of God's word, I will tell you a parable. Imagine a mother with two sons, one of whom was born in a dark prison, knowing and hearing nothing, only shadows and his mother's milk. The other was born in a small cottage and had human food, a bed to rest on, and the attendance of a maidservant. The mother said to the one who was born in prison, My son, if you leave the darkness, you will have more delicious food, a softer bed, and a safer dwelling. When the boy heard that, he left. If, however, his mother had promised him loftier things, such as galloping horses, or ivory homes, or a great household, he would not have believed it for he had never known anything but shadows and his mother's milk. Similarly, God, too, sometimes makes a promise of lesser things, but means something greater by them, in order that people may learn to ponder the things of heaven by means of earthly ones. But the mother said to the other son, My son, what use is it to you to live in the disgusting cottage? Take my advice and it will be to your advantage. I know two cities. The inhabitants in the first experience endless and indescribable joy and everlasting honor. In the second city, fighters are in training, and everyone who fights is made a king, yet every loser wins. On hearing that, the boy went out to the stadium, then returned and said to his mother, I saw a remarkable game in the stadium. Some people were being knocked down and trampled upon, others were being stripped and bruised, yet all of them kept quiet, all of them were playing, and no one raised his head or hand against those who knocked them down. His mother answers, The city you saw is only the outskirts of the city of glory. In these outskirts, the Lord wishes to test and see who is fit to enter into the city of glory. He gives a higher crown of glory to all those he has seen to be more vigilant in the contest. This is why there are people residing in the outskirts who made a test of the ones who are to be crowned in glory. You saw the people lying prostrate, being stripped and insulted, but keeping quiet. This was because our clothes have been defiled by the darkness in our cottage. A great contest and struggle is necessary in order to wash them thoroughly. The boy answers, It is a tough thing to be trampled down and keep quiet. In my opinion, it is better to return to my cottage. His mother says, If you remain in our cottage, vermin and snakes will come out of the shadows and when you hear them, your ears shall tremble, and their bite will freeze the very strength within you, and you will wish never to have been born rather than to live with them. When the boy heard this, he felt desire for bodily goods, but his mother was thinking of it in a spiritual sense. Thus, he felt more encouraged each day, and was spurred on to the crown of reward. God acts in a similar way. Sometimes he promises and grants bodily or carnal goods, but really intends spiritual goods by them, so as both to spur the mind on in its fervor toward God by means of the gifts received, and to keep it humble in its spiritual understanding, so that it does not fall into presumption. That is how God treated Israel. First he promised and gave them temporal goods, and also performed miracles for them so that they might learn about invisible and spiritual goods by means of such things. 
Then, when their understanding had attained a better knowledge of God, he used obscure and difficult words to speak to them through the prophets, adding at times words of comfort and joy, as, for example, when he promised them a return to the fatherland, perpetual peace, and a restoration of all that was in ruins. Though the people were carnal-minded, and understood and desired all these promises in a carnal way, still God, in his foreknowledge, decided beforehand that some promises would be fulfilled in a physical sense, but others spiritually. You might ask, why did not God, to whom all hours and seasons are known, openly foretell that particular events would take place at specific times? And why did he say some things, but with other things in mind? I answer you. Israel was carnal and only desired carnal things, and could only apprehend the invisible by way of the visible. Therefore, God deigned to teach his people in many different ways, so that believers in God's promises would receive a loftier crown due to their faith, so that students of virtue would become more fervent, so that slackers would become more fervently enkindled toward God, so that wrongdoers would more freely cease their sinning, so that sufferers would bear their trials more patiently, so that those who toiled would persevere more cheerfully, so that the hopeful would receive a loftier crown due to the obscurity of the promise. If God had only promised spiritual goods to the carnal-minded, they all would have grown lukewarm in their love for heaven. If he had only promised carnal goods, what difference would there have been between man and beast? Instead, in his kindness and wisdom, in order that they might govern their bodies with justice, with the moderation of those who are about to die, God gave humankind bodily goods, in order that they might desire the things of heaven, he displayed to them heavenly favors and wonders. In order that they might fear sin, he displayed his terrible judgments and the possessions brought about by the bad angels. In order that they might expect and desire the one who would explain the promises and grant wisdom, obscure and doubtful words were mixed together with words of encouragement. So too, even today, God reveals spiritual decisions in bodily terms. When he speaks of bodily glory, he means the spiritual kind. This is in order that all teaching authority might be attributed to God alone. What is worldly glory if not wind and toil and the loss of divine consolation? What is suffering if not a preparation in virtue? To promise worldly glory to a righteous soul, what does that mean if not the removal of spiritual comfort? But to promise sufferings in the world, what does that mean if not the medicine and antidote for a great illness? Therefore, my daughter, God's words can be understood in many ways. Though this does not imply any mutability in God, but simply that his wisdom is to be admired and feared. Just as I expressed many things in bodily terms through the prophets, which were also fulfilled in a bodily fashion, while I expressed other things in bodily terms that came out or were intended in a spiritual sense, so too I do the same thing now. When these things happen, I shall indicate their cause to you. The Blessed Virgin Mary tells St. Bridget how the devil often cunningly leads one and another of God's servants beneath the veil of devotion in order to cause them distress. Chapter 16 God's mother says to St. Bridget, Why did you give hospitality to that man who has a boastful tongue, a strange way of life, and worldly customs? She answers, because he was thought to be a good man, and I did not want to get into trouble for disdaining a man with a reputation for talking. However, if I had known beforehand that it was displeasing to God, 
I would no more have received him than I would have a snake. The mother says to her, Your good will set a guard and a restraint on his tongue and heart, so that he did not cause you any worries. The devil, in his cunning, brought you a wolf in sheep's clothing, in order to create an occasion of causing you distress and spreading talk about you. She answers, He seems devout and penitent to us. He visits the saints and says he wants to keep away from sin. The mother of God answers, If you have a feathered goose, tell me, do you eat the meat or the feathers? Is it not so that the feathers are revolting to the stomach, but the meat provides true food and refreshment? This can be applied spiritually to the arrangement and constitution of the Holy Church. She is like a goose, in that she has within her the body of Christ, as it were, the freshest of meat. The sacraments are like the inner parts of the goose. Its wings symbolize the virtues and acts of the martyrs and confessors. Its down represents the charity and patience of the saints, and its feathers indulgences that holy men have granted and gained. People who receive indulgences with the intention of gaining absolution for their previous sins, while remaining in their previous vicious habits, only get the feathers of the goose. Their souls are neither fed nor refreshed. When they eat the feathers, they just throw up. However, people who receive indulgences and are minded to flee from sin, to restore goods unjustly taken, to make satisfaction for wounds unjustly inflicted, not to earn a single penny through base profit, not to live a single day except according to God's will to submit their will to God in fortune and misfortune, and to flee worldly honors and friendships, such as these will gain pardon of their sins, and be like angels of God in the sight of God. The people who enjoy the absolution of previous sins, yet do not have the will of giving up the previous vanities and inordinate affections of their mind, but who want to hold on to their unjust acquisitions, who want to love the world in themselves and in their families, who blush for humility and do not want to flee from corrupt habits or to restrain their bodies from superfluity. For such as these, the feathers, that is, the indulgences, only result in throwing up. This means that they obtain contrition and confession by which sin is thrown out and God's grace is gained. Then, if they wish to cooperate in order to obtain it for themselves, and have an upright intention, they shall fly as if on the wings, away from the hands of the devil and into the bosom of God. St. Bridget answers, O Mother of Mercy, pray for this man, so that he may find favor in your son's sight. She says to her, The Holy Spirit does visit him, but there is something rock-like in front of his heart that prevents God's grace from entering. God, you see, is like a hen warming her eggs out of which come living chickens. All the eggs under the hen receive her warmth, but not any other eggs lying about. The mother does not herself break the shell of the egg in which the chick is being formed, but the chick tries to break the shell with its own beak. When the mother sees that, she prepares a warmer place for her chick to hatch. Likewise, God visits everyone with his grace. Some people say to themselves, we want to keep away from sin and strive for perfection as far as we are able. The Holy Spirit visits such people more frequently, so that they are more perfectly able to do so. Those people who entrust all their will to God and do not want to do even the slightest little thing against God's love, but imitate instead those others whom they see tending toward perfection, abiding by the counsel of humble persons, and struggling wisely against carnal tendencies, these God places underneath himself, as a hen does with her chicks, 
and he makes his yoke light for them, and comforts them in difficulties. Those people who follow their own will, however, and think that the little good they do is worthy of reward in God's sight, and do not strive for greater perfection, but stay on in whatever delights their mind, using the example of others to excuse their own weaknesses, and the corruption of others as a way to lessen their own guilt. Such people do not turn into God's little chicks, because they do not possess the will to break through the hardness and vanity of their hearts. Rather, if they could, they would prefer to live for as long as they were able to persevere in sin. That good man, Zacchaeus, did not act so, nor did Mary Magdalene. Instead, in so far as they had offended God in their limbs, they gave him all their limbs in reparation for their offenses. In so far as they had risen mortally in worldly rank, they lowered themselves humbly through the contempt of the world. Indeed, it is difficult to love God and the world at the same time, unless you are like the animal that has eyes both fore and aft, and no matter how careful it is, such an animal will suffer. People who are like Zacchaeus and Magdalene have chosen the safer part. Explanation This was Bailiff of Ostergotland, who came to the Jubilee year more out of fear than of love. Concerning him, Christ says in Rome, Everyone who has escaped some danger should be careful not to fall back again into it. Overconfident sailors are at peril even in port. This man should thus beware of returning to his former office. Otherwise, if he is not careful, he will lose the object of his desires. The goods he has gathered will fall to strangers. His sons will not receive their inheritance, and he himself will die a painful death among foreigners. When he returned, however, he once again became a tax collector, and everything turned out as foretold. Welcome to the Virgo Potenz YouTube channel. If you enjoy this video, give it a like. I also invite you to subscribe to this channel so that you won't miss new content. Please prayerfully consider supporting my work by becoming a patron of Virgo Potenz on Patreon and or by buying one of my books. My ebooks are available on Amazon as well as on the Apple Bookstore. For those who prefer a physical copy rather than an ebook, my book, Spiritual Warfare, Know Thy Enemy, is also available as a paperback on Amazon. If you are interested in making a one-time contribution, I suggest that you do so by simply buying one of my books. I am thankful for your support. Links to Patreon and to my books will be posted in the comments section of this video. The continuation of this work isn't possible without you. Lastly, and most importantly, please pray for me. May the Virgin Most Powerful guide and protect you.